Benjamin Franklin once observed that the art of acting consists in keeping people from coughing. I'm Patrick Pacheco from New York One and the LA Times for the American Theatre Wing, and I am delighted to welcome three actors who not only have done that, but have also memorably engaged and riveted audiences in their respective roles. David Allen Greer, who is currently starring as Sporting Life in the Gershwins, Porgy and Bess, made his Broadway debut in the first for which he was Tony nominated, and has since appeared there in Dreamgirls, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, and Race, which earned him a second Tony nomination. Judith Light, now appearing in other desert cities, was a Tony nominee for her performance in Lombardi, and has also appeared in Sorrows and Rejoicing, Wit, and A Doll's House. And Condola Rashad became one of the theater's hottest young stars when she appeared in Lynn Nottage's Pulitzer Prize-winning drama, Ruined, which she memorably followed with Lydia Diamond's comedy, Stick Fly. Welcome to you all. Thank, Thank you. you. It's great to be here with you. And let me start off our discussion with asking you for the context and the circumstances of when you said, I want to be an actor. At five, I mean, I was watching my mother and... Um, Who was Felicia Rashad, Felicia obviously. Felicia Rashad, and, and I just knew from the process of it um, that that's something that I wanted to do. I mean, the, per, the performance to me is definitely the cherry on the pie, but watching my mom um, in rehearsal was what really got me um, excited about acting. I like the process of taking something from a page and actually creating and making it something else. That's, that's kind of what originally... Um, drew me to it. David? Uh, I came to it much later. I mean, uh, initially I wanted to be a musician. Uh, I play the guitar badly. I have to. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was when I was around 19. Wow. I dropped out of University of Michigan, moved to New York, and uh, I met a lot of actors in various stages of their career, and at their urging, Oh, wow. They came to me and they said, we see something in you. This one particular guy goes, he and his girlfriend, I worked in this ice cream store, and he said, I, I, you are an actor. Wow. You don't know this yet, <laughs> but this is what you are supposed to do. And that's really what changed my life. Sometimes you need that other person to go, I see something in you that you don't see in yourself. And it really changed my life. I, I went back to school to study acting. I remember I applied to the neighborhood playhouse. Uh -huh. I got in but it was cheaper to go to University of Michigan. So I went You went back to Michigan? I did, because oh I was like, no, my mother was like, uh, neighborhood what? No, we're not paying for that. So I had to go, yeah, I had better space. I mean, I could live and, anyway, that's what started it. And the first play I did was Othello. I wasn't Othello, I was the other black guy. So, yeah, but from there, once I went into that first audition, it was just, no looking back. I saw, I could see my life for the first time in my life. I was still young, but I, there was nothing else before that where I really felt like I can grow old doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, even music, I was like, I gotta make it before I'm 30. Uh -huh. Something like that. But do so you, that's what do you still, do you still, are you still in touch with that person who said we that We were to you? for many years. We were for many years. And as a matter of fact, he came when I did the first, this was like uh -huh. in 76 when I was, you know, I dropped out and went back to school. He came to see me. He and his girlfriend, they were later married. He had a son and it was great, but I lost touch with them over the years, but he is responsible. They were both actors. Yeah, they would mm -hmm. come. And yeah, it was amazing, but that's what happened. Judith, is somebody recognizing in you growing up in Trenton, New Jersey? Uh, <laughs> and saying, yeah, I had to say that, didn't you? Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it's interesting. I, I'm much like you. I, I, I got it when I was a little girl. I was three years old. And both of my parents, I think, really wanted to be in show business. And so what they did was they channeled a lot of that, their energy, because they weren't going to do it. Um, into me and my mother kept working with me to memorize when I was three, twas the night before Christmas. Wow. <laughs> like a nice <laughs> For a nice Jewish girl. <laughs> <laughs> and I performed it for my father. And I watched his face as I was doing this. And I, I, he was, he started to cry. Wow. And I thought, oh dear this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I ran, I remember running to him and him holding me in his arms and I thought, oh, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Now, that is kind of problematic because, you know, 
is if unless you go either deep into therapy or you know understand <laughs> yourself at some level, you keep trying to recreate that particular say, experience over the and over. high you always oh, say. Right, exactly. You're it's not right. my father. Right, exactly. exactly. They didn't hug me. Exactly. Right. It's like, you know, uh, oh you're closing the show. <laughs> it's what, you know, psychologists call a palimpsest moment. It is the moment <laughs> of that amazing choice. And so then I had to really find my way away from that into why I actually really did feel that this was my calling and really something truly that at a, more of a soul level that I really knew I wanted to do and why I wanted to do it. And I have said so often, and I, get, I think you guys would agree with this, is that we are in a service business. Mm -hmm. We are, we give a performance. This is yeah. for for them, this uh -huh. is what our work entails. Well, that's the other element. I mean, you rehearse and you do these run-throughs and all this stuff, but when the audience comes, that's the final element. Totally. Because they participate, it's theater. It's the oldest form of storytelling. I mean, uh, you know, yeah. cavemen, mm -hmm. whatever, you sit around the campfire, you're bored, tell me the story. Right. And it is developed into what it is still existing. I don't think it'll ever really go away. I mean, I it's agree. what we do. I and it, and it's also, it's like, tell me a story and tell me your story. Well, mm. carry me away. Carry too. me carry away. Me. We all love that as an audience to go to see someone perform. We long for that. I want you to carry me away. I, yeah. I want mm -hmm. to be taken out of my existence, out of this theater, so I'm in your world. I yeah. mean, there's nothing more exciting than that. That's to so know someone else. Mm -hmm. To know mm -hmm. someone. That's so fascinating, your response and Condola's response, because for me, it seems to me, Condola, that it was always about the work for you, that it wasn't mm -hmm. this idea of gaining some kind of emotional acceptance or applause yeah, or attention. Yeah, no, it's the work, it's the challenge of it. It's like, you know, and it's, and I, I love all of it, especially the moments where I get really frustrated. I actually love those moments too, because there's a moment where you always feel like, okay, I don't know, I hit the wall, I don't know right. what I'm yeah. gonna do. I don't know, <laughs> like, I don't know, it's just gonna right. be what it's gonna be. And then something will click and you're like, oh, oh, I never thought about it like that before. Okay, like, let me go back and apply that to this. And so it's like this whole, mm -hmm workshop that you go through in rehearsal that I, I love it and then other people are growing and then every, you grow with them and then it's like I love it. Let's it's, talk about hitting the wall. Uh, hit did you wall. hit the wall with Sophie in Ruined? Uh, Sophie being obviously this rape victim I in the in, in the uh, in the Congo. Well, what happens is that I always feel like I hit a wall and then the wall breaks and then all of a sudden it's like a whole other room. I understand, <laughs> I understand that. Or it's the process of I think I can do this part. You know, you audition, you have talks, you get it. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm getting it. I don't have it yet. I got it. I got it. I nailed it. Where did it go? I lost it. That is that the wall you're talking about? It's because like I feel you, that yeah, you, you got you it. Kinda, you, you lose it. Go through these motions. You of, search for it again. Some yeah. nights you have it. Sometimes you don't. You know, but that's theater. It's every. It's always different and you get to attack it again and again. There's, I've never been a perfect performance for me. Mm -mm. You know, we pick ourselves apart as actors and artists and you go back and that's the joy I, I really have in theater. So I, I don't stress as much as I did when I was younger. Oh. I'll, I have tomorrow. Yeah. That Do the sounds, best you can today. You know, that's that, that sounds Martha scary. Graham quote, that wonderful yeah. quote, which she said, we have this, we're never, we are never, accepting of ourselves. We ha carry this divine unrest within us and it is this lack of perfection but that we n we know that we have mm -hmm. the next day or the next time. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I came to love the process like yeah. oh, you did. Oh, we all have to. And, and, yeah. and, you, and you do, you, you have to love it. But I, I call it, not I don't call it hitting the wall so much as the place of I don't know, which is a very high state. Uh -huh. When you acknowledge it, it's like I find, I go, I don't know what's next. And for a minute there, it's very uncomfortable for me because I don't like to be an I don't know. I mean, you're great about that. You're like, oh, yeah, I like this. I like the <laughs> not know. But I, and I have to get myself to the love of the I don't know. And then once I do, all that stuff that you're talking about starts filtering in mm -hmm. because I think we at some level, I, I, and maybe you guys, I don't know if you experience this or not, channel something. Something's coming through you. Mm -hmm. And you are the instrument of it, and you are doing all your work and all your thoughts about it and all your, you know, 
work on the part and the and the concentration of it and being guided and t you know your performance is different by the actors that you're working with mm -hmm. but something is coming through you yeah and I, I find I if so. I get out of the way it comes through yes yeah particularly yes. though when Speaking with Ruin, because I, in my the way in my experience, there's two different kinds of hitting the wall. There's the hitting the wall where I, I don't know what to do with the character, and then there's also the hitting the wall for me, which is like, oh my god, we're doing this again. <laughs> <laughs> so, what happened with uh. Ruin? What happened with Ruined is, um, and I've always i the thing about theater that I really love is that it forces me to get back into the discipline because it's a very uh, disciplined, yeah. uh. and and that's actually something that I've always struggled with in my life. Like I mean, I'm I was classically trained in the piano and. The discipline part of it, my mother struggled. I mean, she was like, "Are you going to practice or not?" Like, it was a serious. You, know you said that rhythmically. <laughs> like, what are you going no. to it's a do? Metronome. Right? The piano for one hour, please, right. in practice. So the discipline is something that I, because I'm a, I'm a nomad and I get a little flitty and I'm like, I don't know, it's da -da. so it's actually good for me to to really focus on a, on the discipline of it. So what happened with Ruined? Um, is I didn't necessarily hit a wall with the character. I hit, a, but there was definitely a point because of the, uh, because of what ruin was and the things that we had to do mm. every night. Um, I definitely hit a wall of like, okay, we're gonna do this again. <laughs> you know, what I mean? it got to the point where it was a little bit like, oh God, we have to do this right now. And I think we all kind of started to feel that. But the one thing that I that I love about that experience in particular is I'm I'm so much stronger from that. Mm. I feel because we had to do it for so long, but also, kind of going back to what you were saying about the the service of it. Like whenever we got to that point where we really were like, I don't know if I can do this again. Like I don't know if I can actually go through this motion, <laughs> again. Physically, mm -hmm. all of it. Emotionally, I don't know if I can do. It. But the thing about ruin was we were all aware that ruin was so much bigger than ourselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's like this thing when you know that even though you're exhausted or you know that what you're doing is actually in the long run, it's so much bigger mm -hmm. than yourself. And so in that way, it kind of helps you get back into it. Mm, right. And don't you find too that I, I, I used to try to just, you know, sort of get it up and, you know, be there and, and then I, I look across the stage and there were my fellows. Right. Well, that's a part of it too. And yeah, it's like there totally. you are, and you are lifting me up, and it's my responsibility to lift you up. And here I am for well, you. And the work you you we all put in as artists. Once you get to that point when you're running, usually you've been working at it for weeks, yeah. if not months. Mm -hmm. You know, by the time we opened in Porgy and Bess, it was almost a year wow. uh, from the workshop. Mm -hmm. Out of town, New York rehearsal, tech, now we're running. It's almost going to be a year in about two, 60 days. So at this point, there's a lot invested in it. You know, when I come in, if I'm sick, this hurts, that hurts, I'm carried along by this right. community of people and you throw yourself in because that is what life is. I can't think of, you know, there are a few days when you're like, I'm perfect. Right, but <laughs> I'm not too fat, my right. breath is great. It's gonna be an awesome day. Exactly. The sun's out, you know, my best shirt. It's just not life. So you just go through it, throw yourself into it, True. and you're just carried in. Yeah. Do you find, David, as, as Condola said, that uh, maybe perhaps with Porky and Bess, it's more than just about you because of the nature of the work? Is that yeah. true of Porky and Bess, oh, yeah. say, than other things that you've done? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, it's big. It's very big, and it's heavy. I mean, it's not a light comedy. I, I, I don't want to compare it to uh, what you did, but it's uh, <laughs> we're talking about heavy themes, you know, <laughs> heavy themes. It's much bigger than me, and and but that's the humbling thing. It was totally opposite from the ra race. Race had four uh, people. This has right. maybe twenty-five. Not to mention the orchestra, the this, the that. You were really a part of this machine and you have to pass that baton and we all move together, you know, then it works, then it works. You know? and, and Judith Witt, I'm sure, may have really stuck out there in your resume in terms of something that was bigger than you. Oh, there was no question about that. I mean, that is, a, talk about heavy themes, that is the theme of, of life and death and, and, and transformation. I mean, this is a, a person who has lived all of her life in her head and as she is in the process of dying, she moves into her heart and she literally at the end goes into the light. And so, yes, that was extremely, I mean, it was 
and to do that every night and to carry those heavy themes all of the time. I relied on everybody and, you know, my manager, Herb, yeah. who you just met, he was with me most of the time because I really felt that most I... Most of the time? Yes. Manager? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've been there all the time. Oh, but didn't you, I'm sure I, you I, talked I, to, to cancer survivors. Sure. Uh, that resonates with you. I'm sure you met people, you know, who had some experience with the trauma that your play dealt with. Oh, we had people with. from the Congo come to see it. Exactly. That so this is what wow. resonates. Yeah. Which was like, oh my God. Yes, this is what resonates. <laughs> Women in recovery who come to see Porgy and Bess and oh. then speaking with them afterwards and they're saying this and this and this, I, you know, you touched me here. Then that makes it bigger than you and it resonates as a piece. And research, obviously you research your roles. I know whatever respective roles that you do, when does research become a problem? When do you say, uh-oh, I've got to stop researching now? Mostly it's like if I'm not in the room, I don't hear it. I need to kind of cut out at a certain point. Mm -hmm. What is the knowledge that this character knows mm -hmm. that he is affected by that is pertinent to me playing this? You know, So mm -hmm. if I'm not in the room, if I didn't hear it, if I'm not on stage, if it doesn't involve me, if I have no knowledge of it, you throw that out. And then you're given a lot of information, usually too much. And as uh, actors and artists, you have to kind of throw this away. I can use these things uh, that will propel me in this scene. Yeah, trying I think to strip that's... it away, basic honesty to play the reality of the scene of this moment in this production that's what I try to do for me I, I I do a ton of research and then but that's all in my head if I can't use it for my emotional system it's really not a lot of use to me so all I study 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 because you know being classically trained in the theater I take it all and I throw it all out because I know it's already in there. I know it is in there at a cell level memory. And I've used it in the process of rehearsing. Mm -hmm. You know, I've used it and I found my way through it. But I, I, when it's that moment, that now, when I'm on stage with you, it is not in, it's not there. Now you played a she, real life character, obviously in Lombardi. Yes. Uh, so is, does she live for you on the page, uh, the way that it was written, or do you have in the back of your head who that woman really was? I have both, you have I have both. both. But that's when you have really great playwrights and people who give you that. You, you know, I did a lot of research for Marie Lombardi, but also Eric Simon said, mm -hmm. gave me a lot uh, on the page, and also Tommy Kale gave me a lot as a director. Uh, it's the same thing when you work with somebody like John Robin Bates and, and Joe Mantello. I mean, in other you, desert cities. In other desert cities, you have this incredible body of information and the people who are there telling you about it, telling, helping you tell your story. And Condola, when you're creating Cheryl in, in Stick Fly, is it basically what Lydia Diamond has given you on the page that you're going with? Yeah, and, and also for, for Cheryl, it's weird, like the research was a little bit different for Cheryl because it, it wasn't something that I had to go out and look for. It was more my own memories and mm -hmm. people that I knew like Cheryl. That was, that was kind of the way that I, that I dealt with that role, whereas Sophie, I did a little bit more of actual research. Whereas this one, because I kind of went to Cheryl's high school, so like uh -huh. research was almost like, well, what, what did I, where was I? And then I'm like, okay, so I know, I know Cheryl. I actually knew Cheryl, and so it was more about just kind of pinpointing um, where Cheryl lived in my own memories. And did you grow up in that bougie world, as Lydia Diamond describes it? Yes, she did. Um, well, oddly, <laughs> here's the thing, though. Wait, this is the crazy part, though. This is the crazy part that. about this question. That's great. The crazy part, okay, because we had a talk back the other day. Uh -huh. We had a talk back, and, and, and during the talk back, someone in the audience was like, so, Condola, you know, like, what was it like playing Cheryl? Because, I mean, you grew up in the black bourgeoisie. And I was like, did I really? <laughs> But here's the thing, I didn't know I did. Uh -huh. I didn't know it, like I really uh -huh. just, but then when she asked the question, I was like, okay, no, I can see where, I can see where that would, that actually probably applies. But oddly enough, in my family, um, I think it's just the way that the, that the kids were brought up. Like we weren't aware of that kind of stuff. I'm sure that our parents were whatever they thought, but we, I wasn't raised to believe that I was any different from Cheryl, whose mother was a maid, there, there was no, I didn't, I didn't process that when I was a little mm -hmm. kid. And, but, <laughs> you know, we're living, uh, quote unquote, in this post-racial society mm -hmm. in, in the Barack Obama era. 
Uh, you obviously were in race in David yeah. Mamet's discussion of, yeah. of this, which also Lydia Diamond deals with it. Did you find it controversial a lot when you were given that yeah. script? <sighs> it was uh, fascinating uh, to watch the response of the audience. I mean, it was a great story. There's this black couple that came to see race that sat next to this white couple, total strangers. And David Mamet has this genius of starting a conversation and much like in real life it stops he doesn't tidy it up it could go on for another hour and we heard that this couple began to talk about the play and they ended up going out to dinner after the play and they since have become very good friends but it all started with race what do you think i don't think agree with this part of the play and that part of the play well that's great I'd love to be in plays and productions in which you start a conversation and you get that audience talking oh, that continues to talk on the way home. There's nothing worse than, how is the play? I don't know. Let's go yeah, no, dinner. that's what you don't want. No. And, and that's what Other play. Desert Cities it, does. Uh, yes, <laughs> other passion. Desert, other yeah. Desert Cities totally does that. Precipitates those I those mean, it precipitates those conversations and, and actually people are, are, you know, what's so what I find so extraordinary about this play is that Nobody, there are all these secrets that keep getting revealed as the mm -hmm. play unravels toward the end and it accelerates at the end. People who go to see this do not tell other people the secret, <laughs> which I find awesome. fascinating. That's yeah. the only thing. I don't know the secret, I don't want to know. Uh, you're, uh, well, uh, we're not going to so tell you. But, <laughs> but isn't it, but it, it's, it's this most extraordinary phenomenon that people have, I mean, talk about not having an audience cough. When Stockard Channing and Stacy Keach are telling this final secret at the end of this play, the audience does not move. You can yeah. hear a pin drop. It's the best sound in the, in the theater, isn't it? It yeah, is. The silence. Even, even, you know, it's funny. Coming back to do race and Broadway, we all talked about, well, what happens when the phone rings? I've never been in a production <laughs> where a phone is ringing and it takes me out of the scene and my character to come downstage to stop a production. You, I've read stories it and happened. I've envied those actors. <laughs> no, <laughs> Answer your phone. <laughs> <laughs> now I will kill a fellow. You know, I, I am just in it. So I don't, I've don't. i never been pulled out, but I mean, I envy That's those so actors. That's so funny. Yeah. Uh, I I do hear it, and we do hear it. I mean, yeah, when yeah. you know, if something happens, and you know, mm -hmm. but I don't have the. I don't know. There's sort of. I I just don't. I I could. I don't think I could do that. No, I don't, I don't think I. I don't think I could do, do that. Now some like all you all say, some people can, it. but it's like, okay. I don't want to ignore everybody else that's here. Thank you. Watching. Uh -huh. You know? But. Yeah, Kevin Spacey did it, Richard. Yes. Uh, I heard. I, heard. I can't. Uh, and, and some have, have done it with really four letter words. Yeah. As well. Oh, well, really? Well, that's though. We don't, well, not only do we get phones, we get people. Like, legitimately, <laughs> <laughs> there, was a, there was a scene. Oh, they talked to us. Like, oh, talk wow. to us. There was a scene where uh, <laughs> Ruben Santiago had uh, to play uh, Dr. LeVay. He said something, and it's a snarky line. And there was a woman in the front row, and she goes, shut up, Dr. LeVay. <laughs> and we were like, we were all just we're like just this. a woman of color? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so racial. She but wasn't see, an old uh, Jewish woman. But see, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. So, my, my, my people, my people, my people. That's a line from other desert cities. But you know, it's so interesting. I went to see Mountaintop. And people. and your people were people. so <laughs> fabulous. Actors. I felt like I actors. was at a revival. No, no, it was heaven. People. And yeah. you know, it's sort of like, yeah. you go, Dr. King. And I was, right. <laughs> and I, I was sitting next to this woman, and I thought, you know what? God bless her. This is her experience of this place. He is so real it's for her. It's a compliment. And, it, and she was in that experience. Yeah. Uh -huh. And she was talking to him. And he was alive for her in that mm. moment. And I thought, good for you. Good mm -hmm. for you for being out there like that. And those experiences are what we get to talk about, like we are now. So you know what? You were talking about creating characters. And I know for me it was different to do Race, which is a new play. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you have a blank <laughs> slate. You know, there's no previous production, no previous voice, no shadow. Mm -hmm. But then mm -hmm. to do Porgy and Bess is totally different. I, I mean, it's, everyone seems to own it. 
You know, and do, well, of course, oh, I saw it and they did it this way. Right. How are you doing it? You know, that kind of awesome. thing. So, so how do you, yeah, do you deal that? with Well, I came, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the cast are classically trained opera singers who've done Porgy and Bess in many different ways. And I would defer to them. I've never seen the opera. I have faint memories of the movie. Uh, so Sammy I Davis kind of Jr., came in. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, well, so I came in, and that's what I was saying. For me, it was a blank slate. And that's awesome. just dealing with the information from Gershwin and DuBose Hayward and Susan Mori Parks and, uh, you know, Diane Paulus. So it mm. was easy. And once we started running, then I would ask them, well, how did you do it, you know, and this kind of thing. But it's different. I mean, it's different when people have expectations. One yeah. of the uh, interesting things that, that you brought up was the audience, being aware of the audience. Mm -hmm. And when I was doing a story on Mark Rylance, Jess Butterworth, the playwright, said Mark Rylance was the type of actor who would be totally into character, but would know that the guy in the third row just took out his handkerchief and dabbed his nose. Are you that hyper, ever that hyper aware? of an audience? I think it depends. Like, for example, uh, you know, there are, in the moments where I'm, where I'm, I, I feel like the moments where I'm dealing with another actor on stage, I'm not aware because I'm aware of this, but there are moments in Stick Fly where the direction actually is to, this is the audience, you sit and you have whatever you have and you're looking out. So when I'm looking out, I'm in still in character, but I'm also very, oh, I mean, you can't, I'm, I'm seeing you're motion. You're living it. Yeah, you're, you're living, living it. it. I mean, Every I'm night. looking, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm not necessarily giving it too much thought. But yeah, I mean, you see things. Like, you do. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can only see the person that I think is bored or distracted. <laughs> of course. You see a couple, you know who bought the tickets. The one who bought the tickets is like, <laughs> you know, the, the husband or wife. Like <laughs> but it's funny. I mean, I've been in places where you come on literally the first line. Sit down. You look in the audience. <laughs> yeah. Really? Okay. It's 8.02. <laughs> you are sleeping already? Exactly. Oh, yeah. There's always that. But there, there is this incredible thing. I know what uh, he's talking about with Mark Rylands. I, I have that experience. It, I, I think we take in all of it because there is this very sacred thing that happens that we are all there just like we are here together us, there is no other moment mm -hmm. except this moment, this now. And so they are with us. And I mean, yeah, I could go do Silda Grauman from other desert cities in my bathroom, but it's not going to make no. any difference. <laughs> but there they are with me, and they have bought a ticket to see all of us tell this story. And so, of course, at some other level, I'm aware of them and wanting to have them they are my participant they are the other part of this story mm -hmm. that audience yeah. is the, the other chemical. part are they, with they are the other are character yes listening? that's right do i still have you that's, then we go that's on. right yeah. and so you're gonna go on anyway so but. i am and i think that's i also mark rylance's brilliance it's like yes i'm absolutely in character yes i'm absolutely there just like you say but I know you're there too. Yeah. And, and, mm -hmm. and are you with me? Are we in this moment, this now together? Because that's what I want. Right. That's the service of the theater that is like no other art form. I don't really hear applause, like in a musical. Yeah. Like I'm doing, I don't, I can't hear applause while I'm on stage. I really can't. If I do, you know, it's just, mm -hmm. I can't. Mm -hmm. I just don't. I don't, I cannot process applause at the end of my number, but I hear them at the end of, you know, we go out to curtain call because it, it shows over because you're in the moment. There's so much going on around That's me. That's the, the thing. The, the oh, what's fascinating really... about all three of you is that you can convey stillness, which is so mm -hmm. unusual. I mean, uh, I saw Three Days of Rain with Julia Roberts and she disappeared on the stage. Right. Disappeared uh, because she just didn't have the stage chops. But in the three of you, when you're totally still, the audience is still into you. How do you act stillness? I don't know if you can act stillness. I think you have to just be still. It's like, it's like and also, in a moment of stillness, it's not necessarily that my brain's not moving. That's, that. My brain is actually, and I think that's what is mm. the difference between maybe someone who's being still and you're not interested, and mm. that might just be because they're actually focused on being still. Versus mm -hmm. someone who's actually going through something and it's just expressing 
the way that it comes out is through stillness. If there's something actually going on, then you're like, what is happening here? Mm -hmm. Well, so you're watching that. Yeah. I would call it not giving up on a scene until mm -hmm. the very end. And that means as an actor, I don't know what's going to happen until the very end of the scene. I mean, and the other way would be now I stop talking. Mm. Right. And that's <laughs> and the other that's a okay, now it's my well, turn again. Right. That's As different. opposed to exactly to like what you said and... in the scene. There's nothing where when you're watching someone looking at a cup trying to figure out, well, how am I going to pick this up? That's active. Right. Uh -huh. So it continues in silence. Yeah. I don't know what the how to tell someone to do that, but that is. Right. There's no, what I think that's the thing. I you can't act it. It's just there's a it difference is. between being and doing. Mm -hmm. And we are human beings. And so if we try to do something, there's something else happening. But there's that thing that you were just talking about, which is this something's going on with you mm -hmm. no, matter, no matter what. But if you try to do being, right, then it doesn't, <laughs> I mean, I, that's very, it's very tricky language, but yeah. then you're, so you're still doing something. Yeah. And if you know that if you know this character and you have worked your way through it, through the I don't know and the hitting mm -hmm. the wall and the rehearsals and the whole year of the process and all of that, and you live in that place, you will carry an energy that uh. goes beyond you, that is outside of you, that translates to the audience. Yeah. And for sure, mm -hmm. I don't it's know how energy. you teach somebody how to do that. Yeah. You can yeah. talk about it, but the minute you give words to it, <laughs> it, it disappears. It's because you're talking about something that's experiential for people. Yeah. It's fun to experience. I mean, yeah. every it's night on stage with Audra, I mean, we go and Audra. go, it's not done yet, it's not done yet, yeah. it's not done yet. <laughs> Audra! It's not done yet. Right. Not done yet. <laughs> now, now it's done. done. It kind of reminds you know. me of this thing that I always, that, that really rings true to me about acting in general, and that the, the saying is, I don't even know who said it. I did. But <laughs> <laughs> he said it, <laughs> is that acting is not always easy, but it is very simple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's something Simplicity. about the element of acting is that it's a very simple Simplicity. thing to be in the moment and be receptive and just be there, but it's not always the easiest thing to do. Mm -hmm. There are lots of things that can distract you and you feel like you have to uh, but really, the, uh -huh. the actual act of it is very simple. This is, this is so great because what you just said is so important. It's to be there and be receptive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To and, listen. And yeah, to, listen. to listen. But how many times do you think, is this right what I'm doing? Is this yes, right? am I? It's not oh, easy it's to do. Here comes my big mom walk. Go on, go on, go on. Right, 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 right. It's like, it's going on, it's no, going on, it's going on, and it's like, Oh, so you're there too? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Are you? And it's like, it's all, it's like this incredible thing. There's this wonderful book called The Mystic in the Theater. And they're talking about Eleanor Aduza and how she used to work. And she would sit in front, she did more work this way than in rehearsal, it said, that she would sit in front of an open window and listen for the voice of the character mm. to come to her and remove everything that was in her ego to be available to be of service. Right. So it is very simple, but talk about a discipline it's and how difficult. hard that is. It's like, you gotta yeah. get, I mean, we have this ego that takes us into this business in the first place, but how do you remove that in order to let the other thing come through? And how many times do you have this whole thing? I don't know if I like the way the scene's going tonight. Is it, you know, do you know? on a show. I mean, yeah. I did yeah. have an acting teacher once too. He said, you know, theater's not the real life. Real life is unbearable. <laughs> <laughs> I did, I tried to film real life. You sit, you smoke, <laughs> you drink coffee. It is unwatchable. <laughs> so he was true, that's true too. If you filmed an hour before we got here, that's not, it's, we not are putting on a show. Right, right, we are putting uh -huh. on a show at the end of the day. <laughs> so you so kind of have to, mm. It is about innocence and child, oh. the inner oh, yeah. child as well. I mean, that's what I'm always fascinated with actors about because as sophisticated as they get, you know, Marlon Brando in, the, in, his, in his end years, there was still that inner child that he could, you the have Godfather, to. It's a sense the of Godfather, yes, exactly. The iconic scene. The, this uh, old artist, the, probably the greatest actor in our time, Marlon Brando, just playing with a little you. kid. That's like the uh, best. Playing scene. with that I little kid. Love that Thank scene. you, Ivan. You're welcome. But uh, my daughter's four years old, oh. and it's that same thing. She comes in the room. Okay, so we're going to the wedding. <laughs> 
All the kids are asleep. You got to get them dressed, and you're immediately in this fantasy, and you go with it. That's uh -huh. childlike, very childlike. You're absolutely. And that's right. what you have to protect. Yeah. But it's yes, you have to protect it. But it's paradoxical, because one must not be trying to get her father to cry when mm -hmm. she does toys the night before Christmas. Mm -hmm. One must grow up because it requires tremendous discipline. Mm -hmm. We must be disciplined. We have a lot of work to do. We have a, my whole day, I don't know about you guys, but my day is geared for the night. Has I know I'm going to be performing yes, it is. that yes. night. And so you, <laughs> you don't have much of a life because there's always this thing that's right. going on. Well. But it's a paradox, so you keep the child mm -hmm. and the joy of the child, and just like you said with, mm -hmm. with Brando, but you, at the same time, you must be a disciplined grown-up. Well, yeah. you have to. And you, yeah. the balance of that sometimes is very tricky. And you can't be a spoiled brat. You mm. cannot be a spoiled brat yeah, and be in the theater. You can see it a lot, and it happens a lot, but you, bottom line, it doesn't work. So basically, I think it's like the child, you have to be the grown-up adult outside of the piece so that when you get on the stage, the child can come out. That, that's a very good analogy. That's so it's exactly. like you have to like keep very, it. Very you have good to keep analogy. it together, and then and you're free you to go. and you protect that child like you protect your four-year-old. Mm -hmm. But we play. That's yeah. like it, that's it's yeah. in the job. We're doing a play. The key word in that is play. Alan Rickman told me that the most devastating critique that he got at Brada was, "It's not honest." I didn't believe a word. Yeah, wow. That's, that's, yeah. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a toughie to hear. Well, that's another aspect. But it's good to hear, too. We're it judged is. publicly, which is a part of the job. I mean, yeah. It, it <laughs> just like the opening night of Morgan Brothers. I'm like, all right, I'm finally gotten to an age. I'm mature now. I'm not going to read reviews. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, right. <laughs> Seven minutes after yeah. the curtain fell <laughs> opening, like my manager was texting me. I, I know you want to read it, but here's what they said. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm paraphrasing. I'm, I'm not going to read it to you because you, you, they thought, and I was like, okay. <laughs> You can have to throw it away. I won't. I, I, I cannot read them. That's good. My no. managers and my husband were there on opening night. I was so nervous. I mean, I was really, really <laughs> worried. This was a huge deal for me to, to, to come into this play. And, and, I, and so I went into the bedroom and they sat in the living room and read the review from the New York Times <laughs> yeah. out loud. Yeah. And what I heard, and what I heard, said, this is a good right. manager, no, right. huh? Right. And I heard, I heard them at the end of it clapping. They said, okay, <laughs> you're gonna come out of I was like, okay, okay. But the reason yeah. I don't read them is I don't want to have what anybody says, good or bad, stuck in my head. I have a very hard time letting go of it. It's like people come and say, say oh, shall I tell you about this moment that you did? And <laughs> I say, no, 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 please don't, please don't. Because now I'll be thinking in that moment, oh, so-and-so what... said that I, they liked that moment that I did. And it's like, that's, uh, it's very hard for, for me. You Do you guys it. have but here's that problem? What, but here's I'm, what I would For some think. reason, I'm a, I, I, I feel like I used to, and now I just think I, like, I'll listen to it. And then I'm like, all right, well. We're gonna do it again. Well, that's I, I now you're older. We now. all have egos, but I go back to <laughs> at this point. Say tonight, someone comes in. I love this moment. I hated that moment. For me to change what I'm doing, for me to read a review and negate, again, nine, ten months of preparation in which I've sat in rooms with very intelligent, trusted, smart artists, and we've gone over everything. Does this work? Does this not work? Let's try it this way or that way. I really, in times of doubt, fall back on, this is how long we've been doing it, go back to what you've rehearsed. Uh -huh. yeah. Don't change it. And that's what I kind of let guide me and not be swayed by that person who goes, oh, you should you know, throw your hand up higher when you do this line or something. It's just difficult though. I mean, I think it just depends on the way For that you're- For human beings. Right, yeah, it just depends on the way that your brain- Do you read reviews? Uh, Yes, don't lie. <laughs> no, no, I do. I was, I was trying to think about when, when, at what point did I read them. Uh, normally, I would wait a couple of days before I read the reviews. However, it always kind of, and I'm, I'm not complaining about this, but it always turns out that um, I was lucky during Six Fly to get good reviews, and so that's I can't Honey. wait. Honey, so my best lot. friends, like, I know you want to know, but right, right, right. this is what they said. And I'm like, right. all right, well, well now people, I'll read it. I mean, I, I mean, I do have people around me that I trust that say, look, you, right. you have nothing to worry about. Yeah. And then I, I just say, okay, great. Really? What does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. You didn't say I was good. You said nothing to worry about.
I didn't embarrass myself. So I'm not a court marriage. So I didn't stand out. In other words, I disappeared on stage. Is that what you're telling me? Right. I guess that's right. Right. Don't mention it. And now I hate you and don't ever talk to me. But it's so interesting. That is the fascination of the of the mind and how the mind, the programmed mind. Uh, not your intelligence, not your soul level intelligence, but your mind, the programmed mind will trick you up every time. Mm -hmm. and because it's, it's so visceral, it's so emotional. But it's mm -hmm. the find a way away from that. And that, I think, is the process of life. It's not just the art of what we do, the art of the theater, but it is the art of our life. The whole thing. And, uh, uh, yes, the, the, whole, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. and of course, this is our instrument. This is what we bring to the... To the work, but we are our own. Childlike and vulnerable, you have to be open. So uh, there's it's like a, it's a yes. dichotomy. It's That's the right. paradox. Steel the trap when yeah, someone absolutely. says they love you, they hate you, but still be open and vulnerable. But you know, it's great. Boy, it's it's it's, it's bravery. Oh. It's, it's really you have courageous. To be brave. It is brave. Uh, it, is brave. It's, it is brave. I mean, um, one of the things uh, that came up. Uh, a reporter was interviewing Olivier once, Laurence Olivier, and was talking about a different, another actor, and they said, oh, he's good, but you know he's got a bag of tricks. And Olivier looked at the reporter and said, you try going out on stage without a bag of tricks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which I found fascinating. Right. Do you want to talk about your bag of tricks? Uh, do, can, you, can you kind of identify what ah. Olivier was sort of talking about? Something that you can fall back on as a safety net when you're out well, there? I, I know what he's uh, talking about. I can't say that I have figured out that I have one yet, only because you're 12. <laughs> yeah, because I'm 10. And, <laughs> no, but, no, but I, I think, I, I actually know, I know what he's referring to. Um, and I think I've been told of some types, of, like I've been, there have been people who be like, here's a, here's a trick for your bag. And I'm like, I, I can't utilize it only because, um, for example, the only kind of bag of tricks that I would possibly have would, would be um, some kind of an emotional trigger. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm not a very emotional person. Mm. and. Um, these two plays that I've worked on have required that. Of well, me. well, talk about that scene, that specific scene in Stick Fly, where you're on the phone, on getting the phone, some really. My own yep. Because nobody's on the phone. <laughs> yep. Literally. <laughs> 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 Um, because you got to draw out of that. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, and so it was very tr honestly like when we started this process of Stick Fly, particularly for that reason, I was like, okay, because there, there, there is that one girl in drama school. And I don't know how she does it, and it's great. That can be like, oh, cry, ah, done. Immediately, just with the snap of her finger, she's just. Yeah, but she and so, I'm not saying that that's better or worse, but she just can access her emotions. I'm not, I'm not like that. Like, in order for me to reach any emotion, I have to really, I have to really tap into it, or else it's, or I can fake it, but it's not, it's not really, it's not the performance that I will be proud of. And so I actually really have to, uh, don't start really, crying. don't start crying. Please. Are you kidding me? I couldn't. I tried. No, I have to really allow it to to happen. I can't. I can't push anything. I have to actually just almost trust that it'll be there. And so, in the scene where I'm on the phone, mm -hmm. um, basically, that that's the first scene, of the second act, which is tricky as it is right. because we have this break. So we're, it's not even like I have this thing where I'm going. It's like, no, we got a break, <laughs> and then right. it's like, and go. So what I have to do is. During intermission, I spend that intermission by myself, just just staying in it, mm -hmm. not trying to make anything happen, but just staying connected to what Cheryl is going. I can't take an intermission. I don't have intermission. It's it's basically just Cheryl in the dressing room. But just, that's knowing your process. Yeah, it's just the process. And her process may there. I've worked with those actors who can sit there and read a magazine, smoke a cigarette, go right back and to then the do it. Yeah. Camera. But you know, Which David awesome. Mamet said something. <laughs> that resonated, so simple. He said, well, it's nice that you can cry as an actor, but you really want to make the audience cry. That's uh, really so, what's the most so important. Don't go there. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Let them feel that. Mm -hmm. And then I went, of course, of yeah. course, exactly yeah. right. So and but the reality is, we can all show emotion as an actor. We all have this break from, oh, I was great. But in a 1,000 seat theater, a 1,200 seat theater, past the fifth row, they don't the know if you're crying or not. They can't see unless they have spy glasses. Oh, right. dude, it's really crying tonight. But what they can it's read is whether, the whether, the, whether it's actual emotion that's happening. The what they can read it. is whether Genuine. it's true. So my thing is I can't. I can't make it look like it's happening if it's not happening. I understand. <laughs> and you have to start that. Every night, it, yeah. it comes as you said, uh, David. 
you got it, it disappears, mm -hmm. then yeah. will you get it again? When you're talking about bag of tricks, uh -huh. um, as an actor, with each new character, I try to start from a neutral place, meaning remove all that stuff, take away all the things that an audience, they think they know the easy, way to get to this scene emotionally or comedically and start fresh and new and not go to those quote unquote tricks, tricks. yeah um, be let it evolve organically especially in race because it was dramatic this straight play new play how do I find this character and not rely on anything yeah because with that four people two people three people on at once all eyes are gonna be on me and not giving in to an easy choice. So that's that's what I would try to do in every role. And I, I think what truly also one of the things about the bag of tricks is that we do that to keep ourselves going back to what we were talking about before, the I don't know. I uh, feel uncomfortable. Uh, I yeah. hit the wall. It's like, oh, uh, I'll do that. That, that oh, go, okay, tricks. okay. Yeah. Now I'm safe. Now I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Now I have a safety net. But it's like, no, to do what you're talking about, mm -hmm. to go to the place so of uh, yeah. not knowing. Well, it takes yeah. a while. It's like fun. putting on yeah. shoes. Yeah. These shoes are very uncomfortable. You know, you wiggle your toes. You can put a, little things in them, make them fit now, or you can take your time. Yeah. And just really break them in and live in them and, have and that's faith. a truer place that's yeah. a truer place it may not take you it's going to take you more than a day yeah i wanted to ask a, a couple of things and uh one was um in terms of actor being an actor what is the most self-destructive thing you have to watch out for as an actor because you're talking about the process and and it seemed to me Drew, when you were talking about it that something might come in that is just insecurity. Uh, it, it, it's, you're giving a great performance, somebody recognizes it, and you're thinking, I didn't get it, and somebody tells you, no, you got it. Is it the insecurity that, ra that raises its head that is self-destructive? Is there anything I think that you have to watch out for? Yeah, I think that, and this is, goes out for especially, um, I mean, I'll say this, especially for, for, for actors who are just coming out of college and, and trying to figure out what it is, how they're going to. Um, I think the most self, I think the most destructive thing you have to watch out for as a young actor is forgetting why you do what you do. Yeah. If you lose the love for it, then there's no reason to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to just keep doing it so that you can be famous or that so you can, you know, if you lose, that's all, so those are all goals that come with, but if you lose the actual feeling as to why you love being a storyteller, even if you get that far, if you've lost the love for it, it's not gonna, not, it's not gonna, it's yeah. not gonna be anything for you. In a word, I'd say boredom. I mean, uh, yeah, if you like, are not excited to be there, no one else is. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing more destructive than to be on stage or in a scene in which the other actor is bored. They're mm -hmm. not interested in what they're doing. So, yes, you have to be, which essentially is what you said, but mm -hmm. only I said it much better. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. He but did. Boredom, no, but boredom, I mean, you've uh -huh. got to be excited. Do not give up oh. on what you're doing. You've got yeah. to be. Yeah. Tell that story. With and if you don't want to do it, this is the thing, that this happens to a lot of actors that I know. A lot of my friends, I can tell, you don't want to do it. Uh -huh. It's okay. There's something else that you're more passionate about, but for some reason they've gotten it in their head, like, no, 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 I get it, I'm supposed to do this. No, maybe you actually are supposed to be a yoga instructor. Like, mm -hmm. it's fine. Uh -huh. And maybe that's actually what you want to do. And then finally they get to this place where that's what they do, and I watch them, and now I see them, and they're, like, glowing. Uh -huh. I'm like, no, that's what you're supposed to do. That's what you really wanted to do. I went to Carnegie Mellon University, and in the um, the brochure for the for the training program, it said this program is as rigorous and exacting as theater itself. Mm -hmm. And I would say that if you don't know that when you go into it, and you think it's just this great fun, oh great, I'll be famous thing, that if you don't carry the love, and if you get bored, 
And if you also don't remember, like I said in the very beginning, that this is a service business, you are about giving something to somebody else. It is not about you. And a lot of people look at it and say, oh, wow, they're famous. Oh, my goodness, look at all the perks they get. Look at all of what they get. If you don't remember to keep that humility mm -hmm. and that it is not about your ego, but that it is about something, as you guys said, those heavy themes, those bigger mm -hmm. plays, those stories that are bigger than ourselves, that we just get the privilege of being a part of, if we forget that, we're lost. I wanted to ask two things. One, about directors, of course, because you've talked about that trusting eye, and that often is the director. In your opinion, what makes a good director? I tell you, off the top of my head, you know, uh, Robert Altman, who I, <laughs> I worked with, I, I, he said that he felt a director, 80% of a director's job was casting, uh -huh. mm -hmm. getting the right actor into the right role. I know as an actor, I feel like a great director is one who can get an actor to do what he wants you to do, making you think it was your idea. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't want to go through the door, that's... Maybe I'll go through the door. <laughs> like, okay, you know what I'm saying? That kind of thing. Also, that challenges you. I, I like working with directors that go through the process with me. A director who goes, you know, I was wrong about. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're not all knowing. Yeah. Uh -huh. We're going in this direction. I'm wrong about that. Wrong Let's that. try a new approach. Again, never giving up. If it doesn't work, don't be stuck in a wrong idea. Let's try something new. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I would agree with that. Yeah, I, I'd have to say just the, the last two directors that I have worked with have been so incredible. I mean, Tommy Kale in Lombardi and mm -hmm. jo Joe Mantello in, in, in this and, and in other desert cities. And they, they both have this similar quality of, of what I think actually makes a great parent, which is that you know they love you, you know they trust you, they, you know they trust themselves because they have designated that they think that they trust their own choice of you uh -huh. and they give you boundaries and at the same time they let you go within those boundaries mm -hmm. so they are respecting your artistry and you are creating something together that's and that yeah, that's beautiful incredible magic i would have to tell you that marie lombardi and Silda Grauman are every bit as much Tommy Kale's creation and Joe Mantello's creation as they, as they are mine. And when you have great material, like I've just had the opportunity to have in these past two productions, that their guidance and their, their wisdom and their notes to me keep taking me deeper and deeper into a far better performance than I ever could have come to by myself. I wanted to ask the one last question, and it was something that you spoke of, Judith, and that is that the roles that you play uh, are also life experiences, and you take something away from them. You take these characters live on um, with you, mm -hmm. uh, and their experience teaches you, instructs you, inspires you in some way. Can you talk about that uh, in our final moments, uh, things yeah. that you may have learned from I the characters say, you played? This definitely what I have taken away from Cheryl uh, is it's a, it's a level of awareness of where I stand, where I stood growing up that I didn't have. Um, it's so I have a different respect for people coming from, not that I didn't have respect for them then, but I, never, I didn't acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. So now I have a different kind of respect for people that are coming from a different kind of a socioeconomic background. For example, Cheryl, uh, I went to Cheryl's high school basically. She was on scholarship. She probably came all the way from out, uh, just Brooklyn and woke up at 6.30. I, had, I knew girls like this. Woke up at 6.30 in the morning, got to school. Their mothers might not have been home at night. They worked their butts off to, 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 keep, to, to stay in the school so that they could get a scholarship to a great college. I went to the same college. I was not on scholarship. I got C's and D's. I was chilling. <laughs> because it just was, because it just, I wasn't a thing. I was, it, and, I, and I never, I, it's not that I was trying to be a spoiled brat, and I wasn't a brat, but I mean, I didn't know. I just didn't know. That's, uh, it was just there. I didn't have a scholarship, and I didn't have to work for it, so I didn't. Mm. Uh -huh. And, I, and I, can, I can admit that and acknowledge that, and so I have a different understanding of, of where I stand and where I sit. What have I learned from? I'm still learning it, and I feel mm -hmm. like, you know, we just opened January 12th, although I said we've been working for a year. <laughs> it still feels like I'm still 
it's the new run and still learning this character and it's very simple to tell the truth, the truth of these characters, these real people in this community every night and find that energy and that humility um, to tell this story in a new and different way in each night. But that's the discipline of theater. What about the hotshot lawyer that you played in Race? <laughs> <laughs> I know that guy. I wasn't that guy. You were but brilliant. But I felt like I Ooh. knew him so well. And uh, to tell, to also show that dichotomy within the race, his relationship with this younger female black lawyer and their animosity and distrust of each other, um, that was a very unique and different thing to be able to talk about on stage, and that's really what I, you know, learned about that. Yeah, yeah. Judith, I, I think we are um, infinite and endlessly fascinating beings. This mm. life that mm -hmm. we hold and have the opportunity to have right now, and I think we know and understand within us. There's this treasure chest of the understanding of all kinds of universal experiences. Like, you didn't know that guy, but you knew that guy. Well, I'd seen uh, him. I've been in a room with him. Right. I argued with him. Uh, and and you, you, you knew that. You're able to find that and pull that out. And you're able to know that at some level and find that and pull that out. And so that's what I think we have available to us. And so I think with Silda, there are these parts of myself that I have never really explored in this way, this sort of brash, brassy, mouthy, um, always on the surface making a joke, um, kind of person who, f who feels everything very deeply. And so I get to explore that part of myself in her every single night. That's, that, that's, that's, a beautiful, that's beautifully put and a great way to end our discussion because as Tennessee Williams once said, nothing human is alien to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, what you do is you create these characters and you provide uh, sympathy, empathy in some measure. Mm -hmm. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you. And uh, it's been a lively discussion <laughs> thanks to you. And uh, I thank you again for joining us. Thank you. These programs are brought to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York in partnership with our friends at CUNY TV. On behalf of the American Theatre Wing, I'm Patrick Pacheco, and thanks for joining us for another edition of Working in the Theatre. I'm Ted Chapin, Chairman of the American Theatre Wing. The Wing has played a vital role in New York's theatrical life for more than 60 years. Best known for creating the Tony Awards, we stand for excellence, but we also support education in the theatre and our work reaches beyond Broadway in New York. The Working in the Theater television programs, which are supported by the Annenberg Foundation and the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, are unequaled forums for discussions with today's most creative artists. Downstage Center's in-depth radio interviews were created in conjunction with XM Satellite Radio and can be heard on our website. For people who are starting their careers, we have a two-week boot camp for aspiring actors from colleges across the country called Springboard NYC. And our theater intern group provides a forum for young people who are starting their careers to build a professional network. All of the American Theater Wing's educational and media programs are available for free on demand from our website, americantheaterwing.org. Thanks for your interest in the Wing, and thanks for watching.